Five, four, three, two, one. All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick back in our, well, not natural habitats, Drew. You're uh, in Hawaii. Uh, as the background suggests, uh, we're going to talk about the Super Bowl naturally, which ended uh, 10, 15 minutes ago. Uh, and then we'll take a quick look at the Super Bowl market for next year. But overall, Drew, thoughts on uh, a pretty epic game? Yeah, that was a, that was a memorable one. Um, we now have kind of, if you didn't already know it was coming, it's here. Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid have themselves a dynasty, uh, three championships in five years and, uh, all of them very memorable in different ways and doing it in different ways. And, uh, you know, ultimately it was, uh, it was tough for the Niners to put themselves in a position where they needed to come up with the defensive stops in an end of game situation against Mahomes, because it's just not really that likely. Uh, and we know that when the stage is the biggest and when the moment is, uh, you know, the, the most consequential, the, the highest leverage, Mahomes has a, a bit of an innate ability to raise his game. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ace in his back pocket all season was scrambling. Um, and on fourth and one with your season on the line, uh, the super, you know, the championship on the line. Uh, his fourth and one scramble was kind of a no doubter. It felt like his scrambling throughout the duration of the comeback for the Chiefs was sort of the key story. Um, and uh, ultimately, I feel bad for the Niners and uh, you know Shanahan for you know getting this close again and not succeeding. Uh, but they did this to themselves. <laughs> the, the Chiefs had five fumbles. Jay, they only uh, they only lost one. Uh, the Niners had two fumbles and they lost both. If you didn't see the second one, that was the decisive play of the game as it gave Mahomes and the Chiefs the seven points they needed to uh, really help rally what was otherwise a pretty uninspiring effort offensively uh, until the final quarter in overtime. So, um, you know, you need to you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, but it's definitely better to have Mahomes than not. And uh, ultimately, the rest of the league is going to have to you know, have their work cut out for them to stop the Chiefs from getting a third next year. And, um, you know, we're, we're witnessing something pretty special because this is, you know, he's the youngest quarterback to ever start in four Super Bowls. Um, he now has three. Uh, he has a bit of a kind of a mental you know, edge, I think, over the rest of the league. Uh, I don't know how else you describe. Uh, you know, the fact that these teams come up against him and shoot themselves in the foot the way that they do. We saw the Bills do it. We saw the Ravens do it. And we saw the Niners do it. And, you know, it's if you are if you are kind of uh, out thinking yourself because you think you have to play a perfect game to beat this guy, then, uh, you know, you've already spotted him points. And uh, ultimately, I think, um, you know, the side was correct being between three and pick. Uh, the total was definitely too high. Under betters were very, very correct. Uh, the fact that this total landed in the middle is going to be pretty consequential for the sports books, I would guess. Um, but uh, you know, I was uh, I was generally um, was generally uh, entertained and uh, feel like the Niners lost this as much as Mahomes, you know, just uh, raised his game enough to get the victory. What are your major takeaways? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a strange game because I feel like there's not much greater meaning to be discerned from it in that it was priced as basically a coin flip game. It ended up being a coin flip game. Uh, I just thought that I thought the decisive play of the entire game was Ray Ray McLeod fumbling that punt uh, because until that point, Chiefs hadn't scored a touchdown. Uh, They were really struggling on offense. And then all of a sudden just, and I know it wasn't entirely uh, McLeod's fault because it came off the teammate, but I mean, the ball is right there for him to pick up. And if he just picks it up, the Niners very likely win the game. He fumbles it. He can't pick it up. And then the Chiefs are basically just gifted seven points in a game that was 19-19 uh, going into into overtime. And to just gift Mahomes seven points, uh, you just, I mean, you just can't do that. I thought as well that the Niners, the other place they lost the game was just their offense in the third quarter where it just melted entirely. They... Caught, they had six consecutive pass plays that just didn't work out. Uh, I felt that early on, I thought Purdy was amazing in the first quarter and a half. Like he looked completely calm. Moment wasn't too big for him or anything. It's just that McCaffrey fumbles uh, and they don't get points on that opening drive. And they just didn't, they didn't get the reward for their dominance early. 
Uh, and then the Chiefs got their reward for their dominance late. And, you know, maybe that's just the difference between Purdy and Mahomes ultimately. But, I mean, in terms of Shanahan, uh, I mean, some of the play calling was suspect. The lack of usage of timeouts uh, at the end of the first half was, frankly, malpractice. I mean, you basically just have a choice there. Kyle, you can get the ball back with uh, 60 seconds or 20 seconds, and you're in a dome uh, with the best offense in football. Like, you just have to call timeouts there. And Shanahan just seems like he's never going to get better at that. But I didn't think that was anything egregious on his part. I mean, in overtime, um, they had, you know, they had a seven-minute drive or whatever it was. And they I think they had second and four from the Chiefs nine. And at that point, they're a, a massive favorite to win the game. And they just, McCaffrey runs into the line. And then the Chiefs get pressure with Jones. And Purdy doesn't have time to throw to Jennings. And that's, that's the game on one side. And then on the other side... Uh, the Chiefs on fourth and fourth and inches. They run that keeper play with Mahomes, which was to your point, like never in question. Uh, as soon as he got the look there, um, and I wonder if that's something that, you know, I'm sure Steve Wilkes will will mull over that. Uh, that maybe you know you could have planned for Mahomes perhaps uh, not handing the ball off there because it didn't really seem like they were going to go down with. I think it was McKinnon on the field. I didn't yeah, think and, go down with and Mahomes in shotgun. Yes, exactly. So, but I mean, uh, you know, whatever on that front. But I thought that <laughs> Dre Greenlaw going down seemed to really unravel San Francisco because until that point, Kansas City couldn't do anything. And the nine of Young and Bosa and Co. were just wrecking the game. And then all of a sudden, the Chiefs, particularly in that drive to end the first half, they just started getting easy stuff over the middle of the field. Nine started playing a little bit too much in shell. But I mean, ultimately... Like their defense played well enough to win the game and their offense played well enough to win the game. It was really just the the special teams play. Um, and then Moody misses the extra point. I mean, Moody misses the extra point and uh, Ray Ray McLeod fumbles that punt and that, that's pretty much you got. Yeah, uh, you got to be you got to be a hell of a lot cleaner than the Niners were today uh, to win a championship. Um, and the fact that their self-inflicted wounds were so massive is, uh, is pretty, um, it's pretty tough, uh, for, you know, for how they, you know, rally as a team out of this. Um, I will say that, uh, your breakdown is fair. I agree with all of that. I think the other two kind of key moments, um, you know, I, I guess just to reflect on the defenses again, cause this was, this was a defensive game. This was an under dead, not under, right. And uh, the Niners' defense and Steve Wilkes may take some arrows for the fact that they couldn't get the key stop they needed in overtime. But overall, like, this was a unit that absolutely was not expected to perform to this level. And they were amazing for a lot of this game. The defensive line in particular, Hardgrave had some standout plays. Bosa was, uh, you know, chaotic wrecker, even if he didn't ultimately, you know, land on the stat sheet much, which – feels like a little bit of an epidemic now for Nick Bosa <laughs> to kind of be in the mix on every consequential play, but not actually kind of getting the, the man on the ground. He's like the anti-Watt in that <laughs> regard, where he seems Watt seems to be so uh, able to uh, capitalize. But uh, no, the, the Niners defense really stepped up and played a phenomenal game. Uh, and the special teams let them down. The uh, intangibles went against them. And, uh, you know, for, for them to have performed so well and get nothing out of it and maybe even take shots because they, you know, gave up the game-winning drive feels a little bit unfair. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, people kind of pretty clearly – people were beating the drum that the Chiefs had the better defense heading into this one. I don't know that I feel that way. Chris Jones had some standout plays. He was an absolute monster. He always he, – he is in these playoff games. He has sort of the same – um, you know, championship and, you know, medal that uh, Mahomes has surely. Um, but uh, otherwise, the Chiefs defense was just kind of meh. We knew that they were going to be get beat on the ground. Uh, Christian McCaffrey had 160 total yards, you know, and, you know, yards from scrimmage, rushing and receiving. That felt like he could have had another 100 if he, uh, if they had really pressed the McCaffrey button more. Um, and uh, I will say, though, that like Spagnolo, and we heard, you know, we heard people kind of whispering about this during Super Bowl week that, you know, Shanahan was a little bit, un, you know, felt like he was a little bit uh, guessing at, as far as what Spagnuolo was going to do, what uh, wrinkles he was going to incorporate. And Spagnuolo saved his two best plays for the two most consequential defensive snaps that the Chiefs took all, all game. The one on third and four coming out of uh, uh, the two-minute warning. Um, 
that was just a phenomenal decision to uh, to bring the pres- pressure on Birdie with um, on Purdy with uh, McDuffie. McDuffie gets his hand on the ball. It was not even really a, a, a very likely <laughs> completion. Uh, and then um, you know, with uh, with the game on the line to stop the uh, Niners from getting an opportunity to uh, score the uh, touchdown in overtime, uh, they bring another similar, very confusing look that uh, had the Niners guessing. And uh, you know, they had. They basically had the touchdown there, and they just they didn't quite have the connection. And uh, it was very, very close calls for Purdy in a lot of the key high leverage moments of this game. Um, just a little bit of a miscommunication early in the contest, uh, where you know he had a wide open, or, you know, or Ayuk, uh, you know, had his man beat. He could have gotten an easy early touchdown. Um, ultimately, that drive ends in a field goal. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, like this, you, if you replay the first half of this game a dozen times, uh, most of those outcomes have the Niners multiple scores ahead. Like that first half felt very, very lopsided. And you're right. The Drain Greenlaw injury did kind of let the, the Chiefs back into it a bit. Um, but the Niners defense, it should be kind of noted. They were outstanding in the red zone overall until the, obviously the final key drive. <laughs> and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a credit to Mahomes' ability to kind of play within himself and, you know, find a level that others can't when uh, going gets the toughest. And, um, you yeah, know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a little bit uh, – it's a little bit of a, uh, a, you know, a bitter pill to swallow that the Niners lost this game having backed them. Um, and I don't think, I don't feel stupid. Uh, like I was, we were joking that we could have pre-recorded this podcast and had a whole, you know, Oh, Mahomes is a dog. Whoa. It's that easy. Like the chiefs really, really, really needed to catch some serious breaks to get this one home. And, uh, you know, the fact that you have Mahomes means you're always in the game. Um, but ultimately it was, uh, you know, it was some of the plays around the edges that really made this one. Uh, tilt in their favor and uh, Mahomes coming through with the goods in overtime. It's like, you, know, you can change the overtime rules all you want. Mahomes is still going to be able to find a way to get you, you know, to get it, get it, get you across the line, get you, you know, get you in the winner's circle. Uh, did you think that um, ultimately there were any coaching decisions by Shanahan outside of his, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of a lost vision to start the second half? Did you think there were any coaching decisions by either coach that really surprised you or really made a difference in this one? I thought, to me, the only thing was Shanahan outside of uh, not using his timeouts at the end of the first half, which was a disgrace. Um, outside of that, the only thing that surprised me is that with that play at the end of the fourth coming out of the two-minute warning, like so that play is effectively to win the game. You get a four, it's third, third and five. You get a first down, and the game is, for all intents, over pending Moody making the field goal because um, you can grind the clock down too much because both teams – inexplicably burn timeouts when they didn't need to um, in the second half. But co- that play coming out of the two-minute warning, like you have to know that Spags is sending a ton and they just didn't seem completely unprepared for it. Um, and when Wilkes did that, we saw later in the game that, you know, Mahomes has these checkdowns to McKinnon wide open. They go for nine yards or Pacheco or whomever. Uh, and the fact that, one, they didn't have that outlet. And then two, like to your earlier point, Purdy was trying to complete a pass to Jennings that didn't even really seem open and got deflected. So it's like, what what, what were you expecting? Do you think that the Spags are just going to sit back with the Super Bowl on the line? Like at that point too, like in that situation, it's not just Spags' tendencies. It's also that like for the Chiefs, if you score a bomb touchdown, that's a better result for the Chiefs than a first down because at least then they have the ball and a chance to score. So... That to me was baffling. Look, I'm sure Kyle Shanahan knows more than I do about what the front the Chiefs were sending. And maybe, you know, Spags isn't minus 10,000 to send pressure there, but uh, certainly felt like it was in real time. So that was the only one. But again, yeah. I will say, in terms of the principal characters in this, like, I don't think Shanahan will be looked on um, as, you know, a goat out of this, someone to blame. I'm also glad that Purdy's ball to Debo Samuel on. Was it the first or the second play of overtime that Debo kind of, I'm not sure whose fault that was, but Debo kind of bobbled up uh, and Nick Bolton was an inch away from catching that ball. And if he catches that ball, game's immediately over. And all we are talking about is how Brock Purdy failed uh, in the Super Bowl uh, in a kind of comical ending. So I think people come out of this game probably with higher regard for Purdy 
because some people felt he was going to melt and he didn't have his greatest game, but I thought that he was overall good and perhaps even better than expected. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. I If you don't have Purdy with a healthy top 10 rating heading into next football season as you're coming up with rank ratings for teams, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> like he could pretty clearly play. Um, and uh, yeah, the, uh, the Shanahan miscues were softer than normal <laughs> but they were there uh and uh yeah i think ultimately uh um this the two minute the play out of the two minute warning will, will haunt me um in the moment as they were taking time off the clock into the two minute warning i was like nice good job on kyle shanahan and then, and then as we sat there and waited and waited and waited for the commercial break i was like oh my god like you've now given the Chiefs defense an entire, uh, you know, cycle to get completely rested for the most important game of play of their entire season. Like the, I, I think you probably had a better chance of converting that if you had tried to catch the Chiefs by surprise on the front end of that two minute warning. And uh, the, you know, the the stuff you the stuff that you mentioned at the end of the first half was unconscionable. But at the same time, like. Andy Reid certainly felt a little he, – he was looking a little flummoxed by, oh, oh, you're, oh, you're just going to – you're not oh, you're not going to call timeouts, so what do I do? I guess we should go for – okay, well, we'll just kick the field goal. Like there was – it did beget a little bit of confusion on the other side of the field by not calling those timeouts, but I think it was probably wrong. Um, and I think ultimately it was uh, – uh, it was tough that they uh, – it was tough that they didn't find the success they needed to generate a clear two score lead in the second half of this game. Um, because, you know, through three, through, um, you know, through the balance, I thought they were the better team. I thought they had the better offense. Uh, they just didn't give themselves enough of a margin to beat Pat Mahomes in the, in the Super Bowl, which is, you know, which many have now learned is difficult to do if you don't have, uh, you know, a meaningful margin. So, um, Tough one for the Niners, ultimately. Congratulations to the Chiefs and Mahomes. And very all of the laudits that are coming their way are, are very well-earned. This was the worst offense that they brought uh, into a playoff environment. And to win a Super Bowl with that is very impressive. Um, you know, we, we generally live in an era where offense and quarterback play dictates everything. And, um, you know, for a huge balance of this regular season, it felt like the Chiefs just didn't have the goods to get here. And, you know, now they are the champions. So... Um, you know, very, very impressive for them to do this. And, um, you know, Mahomes uh, trying to run down Brady felt impossible uh, as Brady got his seventh head-to-head -head against Mahomes. Now it feels very, very achievable, which is kind of a cool, fun uh, side plot to keep track of as we uh, kind of go through this next decade of uh, NFL uh, football. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what else to say. Like, <laughs> he's, he's amazing. And, uh, you know, he wins three in a row in these playoffs as a dog. Um, so the legend of next year is going to be even more unbelievable. Um, I know that in a lot of Brady's Super Bowls, it felt like, uh, you know, that there was such a, an impossible nature to kind of even rationalizing him losing um, that it made it that there was value to bet against him. I don't know if we're going to enter that window or that phase at all with Mahomes because it certainly does feel like he's, you know, he's got, uh, you know, something in his DNA that's different than everyone else in terms of being able to play cool, play within himself and uh, make the right decision, make the right play when the game is on the line. And it was pretty amazing to see it all today. I, like I never there were a couple of moments with the Niners driving. You know, where I was hopeful they could end at 1916, but I was just like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically just like hoping against hope. Is like because you know that if they give the ball back to Mahomes, like you felt like they were going to score a touchdown in regulation and win in regulation, yeah. and then when they don't get the touchdown on the first drive of uh, overtime, it was like, okay, well, here comes the, you know, here comes the death, uh, the death blow. Um, did you think? Uh, did you agree with the Niners' uh, decision to elect to receive the kickoff uh, in overtime? Yes, I think that's like objectively the right decision. So everyone's talking now about how. You know, you don't know what you need um, and you can be aggressive on fourth down and everything. But the reason why you receive the ball is because of what didn't actually eventuate in this game, but because you get the third drive. And if you score on the third drive, then you win. So it's basically if you score a touchdown and then score again, then you win the game. Like it's in your hands largely. I'm really interested to see if the Chiefs, I, I 
guess the Chiefs would have gone for two. Like, you surely have to go for two in that situation. I don't even know the rule and how that works. But surely if the Niners had scored a touchdown and then the Chiefs score a touchdown, then surely the Chiefs go for two? Or does that win the game? Yeah, because like, uh, yeah, it, it wins. It, that wins the game. And the, yeah. uh, the alternative is you – you kick off to your opponent and it's sudden death and they can win with a field goal. So yes, sure. uh, you know, the, the, the analytics would say almost certainly go for two, particularly if yeah. you have Mahomes home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean like, again, like I, you bet against Mahomes, you get what you get. And like when they, when Moody missed the extra point and it was a three point game instead of a four point game, you know, at first you're like, Oh, oh this, this is definitely coming back to haunt us. Yeah. But then, you know, like, they end up kicking the field goal instead of going for the fourth, you know, going for a touchdown on fourth down when they had it well inside the red zone. Like, I don't know, Mahomes was probably 50 50 to convert that touchdown. <laughs> like, it just, I just, it didn't ever, it didn't feel great. And then if they do convert the touchdown, then the Niners drive where they went up by three would have been a drive to tie it. And set, and then Mahomes wins in regulation. So, um, yeah, a lot of the way that this, this uh, unfolded felt pretty inevitable. Uh, and uh, I blame it a lot on uh, the Niners just not having the lead that they should have had uh, heading into the closing stages. And again, yeah, that comes back to um, you know some un- some unlucky stuff bouncing against them in the first half, combined with uh, that uh, that absolutely brutal gift of seven points that really kind of got the Chiefs going offensively. Yeah, I do think that there is, and look, obviously you'd rather Moody make the extra point, um, and that increases you in probability there is some residual benefit to missing the extra point because then reed was more conservative on the last drive instead of going for the kill shot and also like it's going to get washed away now and so it should but like the chiefs completely butchered the end of regulation in terms of their clock usage and not calling timeouts earlier and because this teams they try to play for overtime too much in those situations uh it certainly felt like the Chiefs were going to win it when they got to what the 11 and there were 10 seconds left and they had first down. Uh, and then the first pass is incomplete. Uh, I would have gone for, I would have thrown into the end zone a second time because you had six le- seconds left and it took four seconds the first time. It took four seconds with a bad snap uh, and Mahomes still getting away. But um, in the end, ultimately, uh, ultimately did not matter. I will say that just the viewing experience of, so last year, I was pretty heavily on the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl because a kind of a rot arose out of the DeMar Hamlin situation where it was pretty clear that the Chiefs were going to kind of be gifted the one seed, which the market wasn't pricing in. And the experience of watching that Super Bowl and just having such extreme confidence in Mahomes when he came out in the second half and it was clear that his ankle was going to be okay. Compared to this year, I didn't have a massive position on the game, but I definitely preferred the Niners to win. So I was against Mahomes and just like the existential dread of uh, seeing Mahomes drive down the field at the end of regulation and then particularly in overtime. Like it is it is the type of like betting against Roger Federer, betting against prime LeBron. Uh, he is, you know, in a sphere of his own, which no one else like Burrow, Allen, Lamar, they don't produce that kind of dread. It's it's Mahomes and he's in a tier by himself. Uh, and uh and I think he will he will go down uh, as the greatest. Um cool. All right. Before we get into next year's future market for the Super Bowl champion, uh reminder the countdown to spring training is on. So for those looking to get a head start on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. Okay, so just do a quick thought on this. Uh, The Chiefs are the first team to win back-to-back titles in... 20 years they are plus 750 to go for the three p the niners are predictably favorite at plus 550 then you have the ravens the bills the lions and the bengals as the next tier um does any team jump out to you as uh, having any value in this market well i mean the chiefs uh <laughs> the Niners are pretty amazing teams jay i don't know if you know this but uh, those would be my two favorites for afc nfc next year um, we're expecting Andy Reid will be back. Uh, the Chiefs just won back-to-back Super Bowls in the two years where they were supposed to be taking their medicine for paying packers. So yes. that's not good for the rest of the league. They had no. an emergence in Rasheed Rice as a bona fide wide receiver one. Kelsey's got another run in him. 
Andy Reid's got another run in him. I really don't know what's going to stop these guys outside of, uh, you know, some sort of weird, uh, you know, injury, um, you know, bad luck injury wise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they should be the meaningful favorites. And uh, everyone else in the AFC now feels a little flawed, um, not just because of what we saw uh, these playoffs play out, but, uh, you know, the Bills are really running it back with Sean McDermott. All right, good luck. Uh, Lamar Jackson is going to all of a sudden play, have a better chance than he had this year when he was a four point favorite at home, four and a half point favorite at home. Uh, I doubt it. Um, you know, that defense is going to start to come apart and is going to get older. And, uh, I think, uh, the chiefs potentially adding some wide receiver talent to Rasheed Rice and Travis Kelsey and, uh, continuing to kind of bolster some of the weaknesses of that roster with, uh, more cap flexibility would make them even more dynamic. So, um, I, I really don't know what's going to stop uh, the uh, Chiefs besides, um, you know, some sort of uh, fluky injury stuff. That said, um, you know, the Bengals are going to be more talented with a you know healthy campaign, presumably from Joe Burrow, although he's obviously not a guy you can necessarily count on getting 17 games out of. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly the uh, kind of the the new kids on the block who emerged this year, largely the Packers with Stroud. I mean, excuse me, the Packers with Love, the Texans with Stroud. Um, you know, they still, they feel like they overachieved to a degree this year. And I'm not exactly sure that they have enough, uh, going on in terms of capital, uh, in terms of cap space, in terms of available players to really kind of move the needle that I'm going to be dying to get involved with either of those teams. Um, I think the team to probably keep a very close eye on has got to be the LA Rams. Um, the Rams had some, you know, they have an ex- like such a phenomenally young roster this year and they do lose their D coordinator and Raheem Morris, but uh, one more campaign out of Stafford and company uh, that could be uh, your true challengers uh, for the uh, uh, Niners in the NFC. Uh, and then I would put the, uh, I would put Rams one a as challengers and uh, Packers one B uh, up against the Niners. And, uh, you know, I think at least as of right this moment, um, the AFC feels less wide open than the NFC. And this is kind of the way it has been the last couple of years now. Yeah. To that point, the price that leapt out to me the most is that the Cowboys are 20 to one. Uh, and, you know, Jerry Jones spoke in a way, I think about being kind of all in cap wise for this coming season. They'll get Trayvon Diggs back, who might be the best cornerback in football. If he's playing that way when he went down and I understand they have the stench of last season and all of that, but I think that they should probably be shorter to win the Super Bowl than the Eagles and the Dolphins. And uh, at the moment they are not. So that was the one that leapt out. I mean, this early on, there is like, there is a ton of margin in these markets. So there's not a lot of value on the board. Like if you're looking for long shots, nothing really leaps out to me. Uh, I mean, like the, the Browns because it's just the weird variant of Deshaun and how good the defense is and Chubb comes back and the offensive line is healthier maybe, but 35 to one, like I don't, that's not super appetizing in the AFC when you have to go through Mahomes, Allen, Burrow and Lamar. Uh, so yeah, the Cowboys would be the team that leaps out to me most the 20 to one, just because of the defense, like for all of Dak's sins, like Dak is still an excellent quarterback and someone who can absolutely Come out of the NFC, so uh, that would be the look. For okay, me. well, just uh, gird your loins for my heel turn, where I'm going to be backing the Jets next year and Aaron Rodgers right. come back, and I'm going to go full in, full on the, uh, the Aaron Rodgers train. Uh, that's probably your best defense in the uh, in the AFC next year, and if there's anyone that uh, really did put up a very impressive show against Mahomes. It was the Jets, <laughs> so uh, cool. if they get something out of uh, their veteran quarterback, in you know, in, in uh, you know his swan song, and uh, that would be the long shot that I would have circled. Yep. No, that's yeah. They they will have upside. Uh, I think also like that team just gave up towards the end of the season, um, and that I think is infects perception a little bit. But we just haven't seen those players with a competent quarterback ever. Uh, and so if Rogers has anything left, what is he going to be, 41? Um, which is so a bit of a question, but 41-year-old Aaron Rodgers is probably, well, almost certainly going to be better than everything the Jets were throwing out this year. <laughs> All right. also, also, they had the opportunity to see that they desperately need to upgrade that offensive line. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
All right, Thursday night is another chance to watch a new chapter in college basketball history when Caitlin Clark chases down the all-time NCAA scoring record when Iowa hosts Michigan. Tip-off of the Big Ten matchup is at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Peacock. Okay, quick thought on NBA. We'll obviously talk a lot more NBA uh, now that football season is done. Uh, anything in particular that you're looking for in the back end of the season, macro-wise? Yeah, uh, Clippers everything. <laughs> I rate them as good as the uh, Celtics right now. Um, I'm on Clippers championship here. Uh, I think they have sort of the exactly perfect, um, you know, the exactly perfect uh, uh, opportunity with four guys in end of game state who can create off the ball, off the dribble, with the ball in their hands. Like that, that to me is sort of a, an unspoken, unexplored X factor when it comes to uh, getting through really, really challenging playoff series. And so uh, for me, it's uh, Clippers are bust uh, between now and uh, when we hoist the Larry O'Brien in June. What about you? Okay, yeah, I like it. I don't don't mind that. I think there is probably a pretty clear gap now between Nuggets and Clippers and and the rest uh, in the West. So it would be, I mean, not ultra surprising, but I think I'd be taking Nuggets and Clippers combined over the field, um, certainly. The thing I'm most looking for in the back end of the season, uh, and it's a bit of a a wonky one, um, is I think the Cavs might be a juggernaut. Uh, and everyone is talking about, you know, the Knicks as the surprise team, well, not surprise, but the rising team in the East that can kind of fill that vacuum that kind of Milwaukee being so blah has, um, has vacated and the idea that the Knicks could be the challenger to the Celtics. I just don't think the Knicks have the ceiling. Uh, the Cavs, I think, just have more upside talent than the Knicks. And a sneaky thing about the Knicks and this... Um, this became very kind of apparent when I watched them in person a week or two ago in the garden, which is that like Jalen Brunson is amazing. He is an outlier offensive superstar. He's a huge liability on defense. He's just tiny and he's not strong. Uh, and what team and in that in the heat game I went to, like the heat are just picking at him on switches every single possession when they're taking the game seriously. And the Knicks don't want Brunson switching on to Jimmy Butler. And so they're just like, they're scramming around, they're in rotation, and the Heat were getting amazing shots in that game, even if they kind of fell apart towards the end. And I think that's an issue for them. I just just don't like Julius Randle. Uh, And I understand that he's a good player overall, but he's a painful player to watch. Uh, He has fallen off a cliff whenever he's gotten into the postseason. Uh, A friend was telling me this, before that he thinks that Randall is the player who has the biggest gap between his level of performance against good and bad defensive teams. Like Rand, if you are a bad defensive team, Randall will annihilate you because he's so good at getting to the rim and he's strong and he cleans up in transition. But like, what, like look at what he did in the playoffs against the Heat when you have you know guys who can switch on to you and you're driving into Bam out of bio. Like it just you just can't do that much. And he's not a cerebral player. He's Turnover prone every time he backs down in the post, it feels like he's minus 200 to get his pocket picked. Uh, and I just don't really see it for the Knicks. Whereas with the Cavs, like Donovan Mitchell is playing at a MVP ballot level. Like he has gone up a notch. They've gotten nothing out of Garland so far. Darius Garland's an all star level player. Evan Mobley seems to have figured it out a little bit. Jared Allen is better on offense. And they have these. They have more depth this year than they did last year. Last year they had like five players. This year, between what they're getting from Struess and Merrill, uh, my man Karis Levert, Dean Wade, Okoro, Okoro's taken a massive leap. He is now a real player. When Mitchell, Allen, and Okoro are on the floor together, the Cavs have been like plus fifteen net rating in five hundred minutes or so. So, I'm wondering if this is actually just the second best team in the East. I also think they are the clear, most likely team to get the two seed because they're in the two seed right now and they have an incredibly easy schedule the rest of the way. So, look, do they have the upside to beat Boston? I mean, probably not because no one has the upside to beat Boston. They're probably going to need an injury or shooting luck. But I kind of think the Cavs should be the second favorite in the East uh, and they're the fourth favorite right now. Uh, What do you think? 
Well, uh, I kind of don't care who's second best in the East because I don't think it matters. Uh, but uh, that you made a very compelling case, <laughs> and uh, I'll be honest with you, I was watching awards markets and I saw some, you know, obviously someone steaming the absolute bejesus out of Bickerstaff for Coach of the Year, and I was curious who that was. I think we just got our answer. <laughs> Jay's out here, Martin Galen, Coach of the Year bets. Uh, you're gonna get one of these, man. Um, no, I think uh, that and Six Man of the Year, right? Is Lavert your Six Man of the Year pick? So you're you're all in on Cavs awards, I'm guessing, yeah. Uh, no, I look. I have I got some bigger staff when he was 200 to one, uh, and so I'd love nothing more than JB to come home. It wasn't me steaming him the other day from 10 <laughs> to one into plus 350. That wasn't me. But I would okay. love. Nothing would please me more than Bickerstaff or Ty Lu, uh, who also got at the same price. One of them winning. I just don't think JB has the juice ultimately. Uh, and it was, I mean, I'm very happy with the 200 to one. I think he can win. But the issue is, is a couple things. One, no one thinks he's actually a good coach. Yeah, that was just because you took the words out of my mouth. Two, he's not going to be a one seed. And that, but the other thing is, is that. Say he has more wins than anyone in the West, which is very much in play because they've got he's got basically the same record now as Dagnow and uh, Finch and Lou. And if he has more wins than them and two of his three best players in Mobley and Garland have missed like a third of the season almost, or uh, they will have by the end of the year, like, can are people really, are they not going to be able to vote? For, are they going to vote for someone else who's not big stuff when everyone thinks that he has, you know, less superstar talent at least than OKC and the Clippers and if he has a better record than those teams when he's had serious injuries to deal with uh, I still not 100% sure he wins in that scenario but I do think he's live I would still though have him I would have him a clear fourth favorite um, behind Dagnow, Finch and Lou you could change your order of those three but I think that's your tier one and then bigger staff is kind of a, a removed tier two but what do you think do you think JB Bicko has the juice uh, yeah, definitely. If the Nuggets get the one seed, yeah, I think that's kind of, you're bit you're basically saying that uh, the Nuggets kill the one seed potential for those other three guys. Because otherwise, I kind of assume that this coach of the year market, or at least until Big Bigger Staff poked his head up as a potential option, uh, I assumed this was a three horse race to whoever stole the one seed in the West. Um, yep. Which is why I thought Lou was such a fun bet, and I still still think he ought to be. A, favorite in this market because I, I'm like I, I'm, honestly my numbers say the Clippers are probably going to get the one seed and it's not necessarily going to be close uh, barring injury so we'll see uh, we'll see what happens we'll see how healthy they can stay we'll see if they lead into load management in March or if they just go for the you know, kill shot um, but uh, yeah it's a uh, he's he's absolutely in the mix and your point is 100% fair if the Nuggets get the one seed and uh, Victor Staff has as many or more wins than the two seed in the West. Then, yeah, he's live. The, but yeah, yeah your your uh, yeah, your 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 point though, which it, maybe it's irrelevant. Maybe it doesn't matter if he's not a good coach, right? Yeah. Like it well, might not matter. I think no one thought Dwayne Casey was a good coach, right? And and he won. Um, yeah, so yeah, you don't have sure. to. Sure. This is, I'm sure there's, there's examples in the NFL as well where sometimes oh, sure. if you have an incredible season, I think everyone acknowledges that. No, it is a, a regular season award. Like you, no one is. The Spolster has never won the award. Everyone thinks that he's the best coach. You almost unanimously. Matt, never, Matt never, Nagy. Never. Uh, Matt Nagy won Coach of the Year in the NFL. I'm not sure. Did you even know Matt Nagy was part of the game plan today? Like, was he shown even once in the broadcast? Like, he, was he making calls or was Mahomes calling it himself? Like, yeah. honestly, like, uh, yeah, there are plenty of examples of NFL Coach of the Year winners who are not covered in glory post win. Yeah. So, I mean, the problem is, is that JB's kind of got the why I was so heavily against Gobert in the year that uh, my man Marcus Smart won Defensive Player of the Year because, like, no one wanted to vote for Gobert after Terrence Mann was dunking on him uh, and hitting wide open threes, even though that wasn't Gobert's fault at all. It was Conley and Mitchell and Bojan and those guys who just couldn't stay in front of their man. But anyway, Gobert had a stench on him after that. And then JB just got put in the absolute blender uh, against the Knicks in the playoffs. Just a, an absolute disgrace that series was. Uh, the lights were too bright, not just for Jared Allen, but for JB Bickerstaff as well. So I think I think that will hurt him. But the thing is with all these awards is sometimes that no matter what people think about you, you can just have a level of case that just kind of takes it out of voters' hands. And if JB, 
my man Biko, if he has uh, if he has a better record than those guys and the Nuggets are the one seed, then I'm not sure. Maybe that does take it out of voters' hands. Um, but he's certainly he's certainly live, and I didn't think that um, a couple of months ago. I thought the Cavs were headed for like 43 wins and the six or seven seed, and now all of a sudden, talking myself into them as the second best team in the East. Anyway, we'll talk more uh, Cleveland Cavaliers basketball uh, in our uh, yeah regularly scheduled Bico segments. But until that point, don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. Please rate and subscribe if you're listening to us as a podcast. And also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. We'll see you tomorrow.